I want to take you back to Tuesday evening. It's February 2003. My mother and I are in our living room. It's in Monterey, California, in the home in which I grew up in. We're watching the news. That evening, U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell was addressing the United Nations General Assembly. That is, all the nations of the world were assembled. During an hour-plus presentation, a carefully scripted presentation, making the case for Iraqi possessions of weapons of mass destruction, he held up a document and said, I would like to call my colleagues' attention to the fine paper distributed recently by the UK government, which exquisitely describes Iraq's deception and concealment activities regarding weapons of mass destruction. When I watched that moment, I told my mom, Mom, that paper he's holding, I actually wrote most of it. In fact, it had been plagiarized from me. You see, the day before, I got an email from a Cambridge professor saying, did you have anything to do with the most recent UK intelligence dossier? And I emailed back, what dossier? He sent me a copy of the most recent UK intelligence dossier. It had been made public because this dossier had gone to the British Parliament. The British Parliament had voted to go to war against Iraq, the country I'm from, based on this document. And he said, don't you notice, pages 6 through 19 are very similar to an article you wrote in September 2002. So I'm wondering, did you write this dossier? And I said, I did not even know what this document was until you sent me the email. So I basically sent him an email saying, I have no idea what this dossier is. Can you imagine my surprise? Now, not only has this dossier reached the British Parliament, now it's reached the United Nations. And I'm telling my mom, 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 I wrote that paper. Now, inadvertently, but I wrote it. And she looked at me and goes, ha, 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 nice, that's nice. She was probably thinking of her Lebanese soap operas she wanted to watch. Anyway, I went to bed that night wondering, would the world ever know that this document was written by yours truly? Sure enough, I got the answer at 6 a.m. the following morning. I got a phone call from London. Okay. It was one of my friends who studied at Oxford. He was now working at CNN, and he said, can you give an interview? And uh, you have to imagine I'm groggy, and I was like, an interview about what? And he goes, wait, you don't know, do you? You see, while I was sleeping in the United States, in London, the news broke that the British intelligence dossier was copied from my doctoral research. A doctoral paper I was writing in Oxford about the 1991 Gulf War, not about an impending war. You see, my the dossier had been plagiarized by the British government, but now this is the thing. What gave it away beyond a doubt that I had been plagiarized? You see, in my article, I misplaced a comma. And somebody in the British government went on the internet, just did a search, it wasn't Google back then, probably a Yahoo search, found my article, copied and pasted it, and in such a rush to get it to the parliament, they never fixed the grammar mistakes. And thus, my misplaced comma in my article ended up in a British intelligence parliamentary document that justified an invasion of Iraq. The comma gave it away. And so the British media ran with it, and CNN wanted my comments. You have to imagine where was I. I was visiting my parents' home. I was sleeping in my childhood bed, which I had outgrown. I was sleeping at a diagonal so I could fit in it, looking at these model airplanes I built as a child and thinking, this is surreal. I went on to give that news interview and hundreds more. I became famous. I spoke on the news during the Iraq War, after the Iraq War, and it was finally time for me to return to Oxford. I had been away for a couple of months. Can you imagine? I'm going through my, in, uh, my mailbox. A lot of junk mail, and then this letter on very fine stationery. It was a letter from the British Parliament. You see, it was May 2003. No weapons of mass destruction were found. The British Parliament had been given a document 
by the British government saying there were weapons of mass destruction. There were none. And now the British Parliament was going to launch an inquiry. They wanted me to testify. So what do you do when you get invited to Parliament? Well, I'm an Oxford PhD student. I thought, okay, great, a free trip to London, and maybe I'll get to see Big Ben. So I said yes. Uh, I uh, dressed in my only suit that day, the only suit I had that day. Uh, left about maybe two hours. The, the train from Oxford to London is about 50 minutes. I left a good two hours in advance. You don't want to be late for Parliament, I assume. And uh, we're off. 20 minutes into the train ride, the train stops without any explanation. Okay. About a good 20 minutes pass, no worry. The train parallel to us stops. Okay. However, that train, when it stopped, they opened the doors. The passengers were allowed out on the train tracks. They were smoking, talking on the cell phones, but not our train. Finally, I start talking to the people in my train car. There was a businessman next to me who was late for a business meeting. Uh, two women in front of me who were going shopping in London. A very attractive Greek woman who was going sightseeing. Thank God she said, I'm not seeing my boyfriend. And then they came to me. It was my turn. And I said, I'm going to Parliament to testify against the British government. The guy next to me, the businessman, folded the newspaper and said, oh, I'm reading about your testimony today. Yes, uh, I'm reading about you right now. Finally, the train conductor makes an announcement. Sorry, we cannot proceed to London. There's been an explosion on the train tracks a few meters ahead of us. Every, can you imagine every single one of the passengers just looked at me and basically said, this is your fault. They were joking. I didn't mind uh, uh, being stuck in the train with an attractive Greek girl, but coming from the Middle East, of course, where does my mind go to? Immediately to conspiracy theories. What did I imagine? A black helicopter swooping down from the sky, landing on top of the train. Who comes out but an immaculately dressed 007? Comes in, crashes into the train car, walks up to me, takes his iconic pistol, shoots me in the head, psh, and then whisks away the Greek woman for a beautiful romance while I sit there dead like this. Ah, Yeah, it's a story of a spy novel. Do you ever wonder what the people who get killed in a spy novel, what happens to them? Yeah, that would have been me. That's what I was thinking about. Finally, the conductor announces, we cannot proceed to London, we have to go back to Oxford. I call Parliament and tell them, I cannot make it to the testimony today. She says, you don't understand, we're all waiting for you. When you get to Oxford, take a taxi and come directly. Uh, I hang up with the phone, the passengers are saying, what happened? And I tell them, yeah, I'm going to have to drive to London. I wait by the door as the train pulled into the London station. This was my, literally my one step back. As the train door opened, I jumped on the platform. I could hear them screaming, go, Ibrahim, fight for the truth. And I got into a taxi. And I tell the driver, uh, take me to Parliament, please. He looks at me, thinks probably stupid American tourist, and says, mate, there is no parliament in Oxford. And I said, yeah, no, 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 I know. Take me to the one in London, the one with the Big Ben. I didn't have the address. <laughs> anyway. He asks, do you know how much that ticket will, uh, do you know how much it will cost to drive to London? I said, no. Do you? The driver goes, well, no. Nobody's ever asked me to drive them to parliament. I just said, drive, there will be a woman waiting there with the money. And he drives. The minute we get out of Oxford itself, he asks, why are you taking a taxi to Parliament? And I said, I have to testify against the British government. And I told him the whole story just as I'm telling you now, and then he goes, vroom, vroom, and steps on it. He had an important passenger now. Now he's weaving in and out of the traffic. One hand on the steering wheel, another on the phone, talking to his partner, saying, you don't know who I have in the back of my taxi. We pull into Parliament. A woman is waiting there with a bag of cash. I think she collected donations from every member of Parliament to pay for my fare. It was 266 pounds. Yes, enough for a plane ticket. Now, how is it giving a testimony in Parliament? Was I nervous? No. After what happened, the worst had already passed me. It was perfectly fine. 50 minutes, I just said, on the record, I've been plagiarized. I didn't give my research willingly over to the British government. The head of the inquiry... A member of parliament said, thank you, and I recommend you take the bus back to Oxford tonight. <laughs> By that time, I was getting famous. The acclaimed Brazilian writer, Paulo Coelho, 
wrote about me in the newspaper. Okay? In fact, you see, fame is interesting. Then a book came out. It's called Eats, Shoots, and Leaves by Lynn Truss. Okay? It's about the proper use of commas. At the very end of the book, she concludes, the very end of the book, remember the case of Ibrahim al Marashi and his misplaced comma, which proved the British government's plagiarism. And I was like, ah, oh, this is a little embarrassing. But come on, how many people are going to read a book about commas? <laughs> Apparently, three million. <laughs> the book is still in publication to this very day. I was featured in the film, in a film. Who played me? Leonardo DiCaprio, you might think? Ryan Gosling? In the film, they made my character into a woman. <laughs> Maybe as a way to get royalties, I don't know. No. You see, you might think all this fame was two steps forward. It was not. My dream had always been to get my PhD and get an uh, academic position in Istanbul, Turkey. It was the city of my dreams. I loved it. Uh, right after I finished my PhD, it was 2004. I'm uh, beginning a job at a university, okay? And a newspaper comes out. Okay? I'm sitting in the cafe, and a, a newspaper edition comes out on Sunday. And I see somebody reading it, and I'm like, this face looks familiar. It was my face. What did the headline say? The man who finished off Saddam Hussein has just moved to Istanbul. Now, do you see the tenor of the article? What is it? It's basically saying the whole entire Iraq war, I was the mastermind. I wrote that document to deliberately uh, justify the invasion of Iraq to overthrow Saddam as an Iraqi exile. Again, I was worried, but like with the book with the commas, I was like, how many people read this newspaper in Istanbul? I left the cafe, got into the taxi. The taxi driver looked at me and said, why did he start the Iraq war? <laughs> the man who makes chestnuts on the street hands me a warm bag of chestnuts. Why did he start the Iraq war? My first time teaching at this university, I could hear students protesting outside, holding up posters saying, we don't want the architect of the Iraq war on our campus. That was, I mean, that one step back, you see. The fame had made me infamous. Okay. And I had to now leave this country I had worked all my life to move to. The entire PhD was to move to Istanbul and start looking for a new job. Uh, by 2008, I decided to take a risk on a brand new university that was opening. Okay. Uh, it was in Spain. I didn't know much about Spain. I didn't know anyone in Spain. It was called IE University. And talk about taking a risk. I came in 2008. The university had zero students. I thought I would get fired. Uh, obviously, the students, uh, the universities uh, picked up. It's 2002. I'm still at this university, which I like to joke stands for Ibrahim's Excellent University, or Ibrahim's <laughs> Educational University. It's amazing how that misfortune, the greatest two steps forward in my life was when I took that plane from Istanbul to Madrid. That fame was addictive. The minute you lose it, you lament it. Okay. I did get the ability to write a lot of opinion editorial articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post, a good number critical of the British government. And in October 2001, U.S. Secretary of State, former U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell died. That presentation at the U.N., the greatest blemish on his record. And of course, what was my immediate instinct was to write an article. Now, of course, the day he died, I was on a plane to my sister's, I was leaving Madrid on a plane to my sister's wedding. Doesn't matter, I'm about to board the plane, I'm ready to write this article. And then I stopped, and I closed the computer. If I had written that article, that would have been one step back from me. You see. Sometimes the one step Two steps forward, one step back, okay. Uh, it's in our control of where we land. And I realized by not writing the article,
by doing nothing, that would be the ultimate two steps forward, okay? by letting go of the past. Because after all, sure, Colin Powell was involved in a war, a war that justified the invasion, uh, the, a process that justified the invasion of Iraq, where my family came from, where I lost relatives, people died. But me as a person, I realized, let me let this man rest in peace. By letting Colin Powell rest in peace, so could I. So, it's a final lesson for the students, or even some of the adults out there listening. If you're ever tempted to plagiarize, remember, it's going to be one step back, and there's new, no two steps forward afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>